Okay, um, turn in your Bible, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And we are going to read verses 1 through 7. This is a true saying. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Dear God, please help us. Help me tonight as I preach. Help uh, the hearers as they listen. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. Now, in chapters 1 and chapter 2, um, I made comment of the fact that Paul is giving instructions to Timothy, his own son in the faith. So, in one sense... The books of First and Second Timothy are letters that a father writes to his son, giving him instructions on what he should believe, how he should act, and how he should charge others to believe and act. Um, but in another sense, these books are actually called the pastoral epistles uh, because they deal with... Um, how a man ought to be as uh, in the office of a bishop, as we read in verse 1. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And so in the verses we just read, verses 1 through 7, what we have is what are often referred to as requirements uh, to be in the ministry. And the intention of referring it, uh, of calling it, calling it that, requirements, uh, the intent of that is that if you don't, ma- if you don't match one of these items, then you have no business being in the ministry. You should be out of the ministry. And we're going to go through each of these individually, one at a time, um, not tonight. Uh, and kind of deal with what actually is being said, because there's some really common misconceptions and lies that are being told about some of these items. But I want to call your attention to the fact tonight that if this, if this is a list of, mu- of requirements that you absolutely cannot have no business being in the ministry, if you're weak in one of these areas then every preacher that I have ever met should get out of the ministry. Because not one of us, not one of us, not Dr. Ruckman, not myself, not uh, Pastor Valente, who I grew up uh, under, not Pastor Williams in Rhode Island, not Pastor Tom Messer in Jacksonville, not certainly not Dr. Gray, not any of these, not any of these men uh, fulfill these things 100%. What these are are a set of guidelines that you need that you should shoot for what you ought to be. Uh, but as we read in Romans chapter three, there is no difference. Uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody falls short. Nobody keeps the whole law. Nobody. Uh, the Bible says in First John chapter one. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And from that verse, I realize and understand that it is a matter of God's justice to forgive us when we sin. He would be unjust and sinning to not forgive us when we confess to him 
because our sin is paid for. So it would be wicked and evil uh, to go to God for God if we went to him for forgiveness and he didn't give it. Because he paid for it. Uh, and and offered that to us already. So if he offers you something and then doesn't give it to you when you ask for it, well, that's just not right. Amen. <laughs> and it's also not true. That's why it says he is faithful. He'll continue doing it. He'll do it every time you ask. And he is just to do it. But before and after those ver- that particular verse, which is verse 9, there are other verses that say, if we say that we have no sin, we lie and do not the truth. If we say that we had not sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You cannot say that you meet all of the qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3 if you're a bishop or anybody else. Because no man has, just like no man except for Jesus Christ, has lived a life without sin. 1 John chapter 1. But he did. Amen. Uh, in all points, he was in all points tempted like as we are, same way we are, yet without sin, the uh, Bible says in, in the book of Hebrews. So, and then let me show you uh, verse 15. So 1 Timothy chapter 3 and look down in verse 15, which is kind of a, or actually verse 14, which is kind of a summary, verses 14, 15, 16 are a summary of the chapter. And he says in verse 14, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, colon. Which means whatever comes after uh, is connected to these things write I unto thee. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. So what these re- so-called requirements are in the beginning of chapter 3 and the same thing for deacons in verses 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. They fall under the category of this is how you ought to behave yourself. This is what's right to do. This is how you ought to be. Uh, but it's, but under no, con, under no circumstances anywhere in this chapter or ten chapters in either direction, or in the entire New Testament, does it ever say that you cannot be a bishop if you fall short in one of these respects? It just says this is what you should be. This is how you ought to be. Um, Verse 15, that thou uh, oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Amen? Um. So look at verse 1. This is a true saying. Amen. (laughs) This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So first of all, what is a bishop? Well, a bishop is an office. Uh, According to the verse, it's an office. And it's an office that is commonly held by older men. Um not women. So notice that it says, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Notice that one of the uh, so-called requirements in verse 2, uh, the husband of one wife. Uh, verse 4, one that ruleth well his own house. Verse 5, for if a man. So point number one, bishops must be men. They cannot be women. Women cannot be have the office of a bishop. And we live in a day and an age where women in general, just like uh, they prophesied in the first chapter of the book of Esther, when the, uh, the, the wife of Ahasuerus uh, didn't want to obey, uh, and they all got together and said, well, if you let her get away with this, then all the women in the whole land are going to follow her. <laughs> Uh, which is, which didn't happen because he didn't allow, he didn't allow it. He did right as a husband, um, in that respect of not allowing her rebellion. Um, but today in this day and age in which we live, we live in a day and age where the role of men, of men and women, uh, is not that God instituted in Genesis chapter, uh, one, two, and three. In Ephesians chapter 5, 
in um, all in First Corinthians 11. Uh, in Peter, in Titus, in almost every book of the New Testament and in the Old Testament, the roles that God gave to men and women are not uh, recognized. Matter of fact, they're considered to be wicked and evil by the world. And if this message, and I, what I just said, uh, and if I preach, which I do, those things that the Bible says, if somebody gets wind of that in the world, which they can, these messages are public, then I would be considered uh, abusive just by saying those things. Uh, it doesn't matter that I love my wife, that I take care of her, that I protect her. In the, in the eyes of the world, the Bible view of the roles in men and women are oppressive and evil and, frankly, against the law in practice, in, in, in the way that it's uh, executed um, uh, by the by the uh, the branch that executes. <laughs> it's considered wicked and evil. And so this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. But the Bible doesn't really care, amen, about what the world thinks. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It says over and over again, not to go along with the sensibilities of the times. In its own words, forgive my paraphrase. Um, but how about this? The time shall come when they shall not endure sound doctrine, but shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Those are the Bible words that say that, that say uh, these things will be fallen in the street, that people won't accept them. Even the most basic, simple thing Paul said in one place, he said, uh, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. And what that says to me is that there's no place where you can go in this world where where traditional marriage is not considered to be honorable. Except the United States of America, amen, where where the, where the right thing uh in their eyes is to promote diversity and to do away with uh traditional models and what they call stereotypes. And, all, and that's false. That's the work of the devil. But this is a true saying. Amen. That's not a true saying. It's not, it's not a true saying that, uh, in the beginning God created Adam and Steve. He didn't create Adam and Steve, he created Adam and Eve. It says, in the beginning he that made them, made them male and female. Amen. So, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So I've heard a lot of preaching on this verse, having been to three Bible colleges uh, in my travels. And I've heard a lot of different preaching on this verse. And, well, a desire to be a bishop constitutes a call, which that's not what the verse says. Um, or that you should desire to be a bishop because you just, you know, you're, you're part of a machine um where we're trying to uh recruit men uh to increase the size and the profitability of our machine so the more preachers that we have that we can control that we can place in different places around the country um that can be outlets to send young men to our bible college uh and so forth and and I'm not against evangelism amen and I'm not against planting churches but let's just face it, that's not what you guys are doing. You're planting satellite offices uh, that can produce revenue directly or indirectly is what you're doing. And that's a subject for another message. Um, but if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Okay, you want to be a – Daniel said to me one time that he – had a desire uh, to be a pastor a couple years ago. He mentioned it one time. Okay, good. That's a good thing to want. He desireth a good work. But what you should realize is that it's a work. It's not a, a position that will set you above other people. It's not something that you should go around being proud about. It's not something that you should use to lord over other people like the Gentiles do. 
or in the language of independent Baptists, um, the church is not a democracy, it's a dictatorship. And the pastor's in charge, and he's in charge of everything. He's in charge of how we do this, he's in charge of how we do that, and I'm going to show you later on tonight that the the idea that there can only be one pastor is against the Bible. Which I'm not saying you can't just have one pastor. Um, we'll get to that in a little bit. But your whole idea is is the spirit of what you're doing has nothing to do with the teaching of the New Testament, although you've rested the scriptures to to convince everybody that it does. The spirit of what you're doing is to set yourself up as a king so that you can lord it over God's heritage and not by example but by command and that doesn't mean you can't uh, command he said um, in chapter 1 that thou mightest charge some that they, that they teach no other doctrine and in verse 18 this charge I commit unto thee son Timothy and in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 2 he said the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. But what we're talking about here, the work of a bishop in the New Testament, is the work of imparting spiritual gifts to faithful men. Not the work of heaping to yourselves worshipers of yourself. Not the work of increasing, and in the words of 1 Timothy 6, in gain, uh, in finance, in number. And, uh, and you should preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. You should go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. When you're standing in line at Starbucks on your way to work in the morning, um, you shouldn't just sit there quietly and wait. You should be praying for an opportunity to the, talk to the guy in front of you and have an informal conversation and preach to him the gospel in whatever words God gives you in that moment. You should look for an opportunity to preach the gospel to people. And then, once you've led them to the Lord, uh, if God uh, gives that, if God's gracious, and the, and, the, and the person you're preaching to gets saved, then you should seek to develop a relationship with them and try to teach them things. And if you get more than one of you, you should form a church. Amen. <laughs> Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. But what I, and that's the office of a bishop. It's the, and, and it involves work. So why wouldn't it? The Bible says, study to show thyself a, a, approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that verse there in 2 Timothy 2.15 primarily has to do with studying the word of God. But the first job of a bishop is to feed the sheep. And how are you going to feed the sheep if you don't study? Amen. And I'm not saying you got to learn Greek and Hebrew. As a matter of fact, I'm saying those things will hurt you in your faith and they will lead you astray and out of the will of God and into heresy. Because there is a difference in meaning between what you will find is reported as the meaning of Greek words and Greek syntax and what the Bible clearly says in English. And the verse that I just quoted is a prime example. Study to show, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Right? So the key to studying the Bible is rightly dividing it. Well, number one, working at it, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. Number, secondly, not being ashamed of what it says. Thirdly, rightly dividing it. So the Bible has divisions. So the word divide means divide. Like in the beginning, God divided the light from the darkness, right? No, not according to anybody uh, that you come across who has studied Greek and believes Greek to be the final authority. To them, the word divide doesn't mean divide at all. It means inspect. Which has no relationship at all to the way that we understand the word in English. To the word that God gave us in our own language. See? There is a difference in meaning 
And that's part of the work of a bishop, to feed the sheep, to study so that he is capable, by God's grace, uh, and not that he is ever capable, but that to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a worker that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And in all those and in all that work, it's Jesus Christ that does it through you. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live my life by faith. I trust God. I study like he told me to. And I believe the things that he tells me when I read it off the page in English. And I study to make sure that I'm not taking it out of context. I study the, the context before and after. I study the chapter. I study the book. I study the cross references. I study according to the instructions that are explicitly given in this book. Why? So that I can feed the sheep. Which is my primary job. Turn to John 21. Keep your finger in First Timothy. Turn to John 21. My job is not to start a, a program. My job is not to run buses, though, you know, if that's how God leads you, I don't see anything wrong with running buses, though I think in this day and age you're just asking for a legal battle uh, because some kid is going to accuse you of molesting him, whether you did or not. And whether you did or not, you're providing an opportunity for that kind of a thing to happen, where it's where it's easy for that kind of a thing to happen. And you should trust God and go to God in prayer about whether or not you should do that. I personally have not been led to do that. But John uh, John 21, look in verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him the second time. So this is the second time that he's saying the same thing. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time. So this is the third time he's saying the same thing to him. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time. So now he's getting frustrated because he keeps asking him the same exact thing over and over again. Because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. So firstly, first of all, I want you to notice that the thing that he said to him three times was not build a gymnasium. It was not start a Bible college. It was not run a bus. It was feed my sheep. Impart unto faithful men the things which thou hast heard of me. Feed them. Uh, teach them the word of God. That's why one of the things in 1 Timothy 3 is apt to teach. That's why in Ephesians chapter 4, pastor and teacher is expressed as the same thing. Uh, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. See, pastors and teachers are together because a pastor is supposed to also be a teacher as well as a preacher of the word of God. Preach the word, he said. Be instant, in season, out of season. So the thing that he said to John, the primary thing, the first thing before he said anything else was feed my sheep. And if you don't know, uh, he said in Luke chapter 4, he said it also in Matthew chapter 4, he said it also in the book of Deuteronomy, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So when he said feed my sheep, he meant feed them the word of God. Not, you know, man's pancake, men's pancake breakfast. Not that there's anything wrong with eating pancakes or having a pancake breakfast. I myself love pancakes, especially with Vermont um, maple syrup. 
I love pancakes. I love big lumberjack breakfasts. I can't get enough of them. But that has nothing to do with my primary job or or your primary job, if you're a pastor, uh, excuse me, bishop, is is to feed the sheep. He said it three times. And by the way, he said the same thing three times. Lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. And to the point of Greek, it's a famous argument that there are three words for Greek, for love, for the word love in Greek. And Greek is better than English because it, English doesn't, doesn't have the nuances that Greek has and it doesn't recognize the difference in meaning between the three words for love. Well, one of the words is uh, eros, which is the Greek word for romantic love, which doesn't occur in the Bible. So I don't know what you're talking about with that. <laughs> that has nothing to do with anything. Uh, and the other two words are both used in this passage interchangeably because he said, he said unto him the first time, he said unto him the second time, and he said unto him the third time. He said the same exact thing all three times, meaning both Greek words mean the same thing. What do they mean? They mean the word that God gave you in English. No Greek needed. Amen. I'm telling you, people that go to the preachers that go to the Greek steal from you the ability to learn from God directly. To hear from God's word directly. To, to be able to trust that what you read on the page, what you see is what you get. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Present tense. So God is speaking today in a 2,000 year old language that nobody in the world speaks. Right? <laughs> is their argument. Um, no, he speaks today in the language of the world, in the language that he gave this book to us in. And what he said was, lovest thou me? No Greek needed. All right, so the office of a bishop involves work. It's, it's an office and it's a work. And that work involves study. And the first uh, part of that work is to feed the sheep. Turn to First Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And look down in verse 1. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So he knew that he was going to be getting some rewards. Amen. And this is the instructions that he gives to elders. Verse 2. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. And that's a reference to your willingness, by the way, the, the willingness of the preacher. You should be willing. Don't do it just because you have to. Do it because you're willing to please God and serve God. Um, the Bible says in Galatians 1, um, uh, uh, men pleasers. Uh, if I yet, for if I yet pleased men, for do, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So if when you get up to preach and you feed the flock uh, the word of God, you give them the word of God, you, you give them the things that they need to grow, uh, to increase in faith, to be comforted, to be convicted. And by the way, you can also go directly to the word of God for that without the preacher. But it is a job that God gave the preacher. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1 that God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So you can't read very far in this book without understanding that you need to be under some preach, some good preaching. Amen. Not that you can't also learn on your own. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. So it involves oversight, not by constraint, that's you, uh, don't do it because you have to, because you're constrained to, but willingly, 
not for filthy lucre. So not for your for profit, not for money, not for gain, but of a ready mind that's study. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So that's a crown that's awarded to elders slash uh, what we call, well, the Bible never directly calls a bishop a shepherd. But it does imply uh, in this passage that the elders are shepherds and Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd. If there's a chief shepherd, then there's other shepherds which are not chief. Chief implies more than one, and the chief is the top one. Amen? Um, so uh, commonly the word under shepherd is used, um, but... That's neither here nor there. The job of a pastor, the job of a bishop, uh, is not to, um, you know, oversee. It is to oversee, but it's to oversee the flock. It's not to oversee a hierarchy, a hierarchical organization um, with different tiers of peop- of levels of authority of people under you. Because although you should charge some, they teach no other doctrine. And you should preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. You should do those things. But you shouldn't make, you can't make anybody do anything. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Your leadership is meant to be by example. And to that end, the requirements of a bishop, which we'll look at in more, in more particular later in another message, are essentially the same uh, as the requirements for a deacon, which are also essentially the same for how any elder, any older man, man uh, should be. So when I was a boy, I was in Awana clubs. Uh, approved workmen are not ashamed. I don't know how familiar you're probably familiar with that. If you're not, it's a kids club for to learn Bible, play games, and there's a preaching session at the end. And um, my dad was one of the leaders. And one of the one of the part of the evening during when we had a wana was you'd work on your Bible memory and quote scripture to. Uh, one of the leaders and you had a handbook and requirements and you'd go through and like get medals and stuff for all the scripture that you memorized. And one time I asked the guy I was, I was reciting to, I said, well, how come you don't know these? How come you have to look them up? And he said, well, you know, if you're going to be a pastor or in the ministry or something, then this is the thing you ought to do. You ought to memorize scripture. Uh, if you're going to be a preacher and preach and stuff, but you know, if you're just a normal layman, you don't need to do all that stuff. You can count on the preacher to give you the word of God that you need. And that is a lie of the devil. Every man who is a Christian uh, should be the things that are listed here in, in 1 Timothy 3 and in other places of the New Testament. Which is why, turn to chapter 4 uh, and look down at verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth. But be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation and charity and spirit and faith and purity. He said, be thou an example. So whatever the bishop is supposed to be, he's supposed to be those things as an example to everybody else in the flock who's also supposed to be those things. In terms of word, conversation, which is uh, manner of life, the way that you live your life, not, and also your speech, um, charity, right? Charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. You should believe the same things. You should think the same way. Uh, you should say the same things um, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. The Bible says in Philippians chapter one. And not just to the point of being unified, 
but to the point of, look, we're all meant to grow. You, you're all meant to increase in faith. God gave this book to everybody. He gave it to you, Dale. He gave it to you, Michael. He gave it to you, Daniel. He gave it to you, ladies. He gave it to everybody uh, to help you to, to find the things that you need to make it through life, to be comforted, to be strengthened, to increase in faith, to grow. The Bible says in one place in Romans 15, uh, for, and I trust that you also are able to admonish one another. So it's not just the preacher's job to exhort and admonish. Amen. You're supposed to be doing that to each other. You're all supposed to be memorizing scripture. You all should be on some kind of, you don't have to be on a you know program, but you should every day be looking to the word of God for help and grace. Uh, to, to get you through the day, to give you what you need to act. What should I say to this guy that's going to come work on my plumbing? Uh, how should I act towards uh, this student at work who comes to me for counsel? How should I present myself? I, I have to get my mind right every morning before I talk to anybody by looking at this book. Now, I might look at it just for a moment. I might think about it and, and recite something in my mind. But if I just get up in the flesh and go through the day, I'm a different guy. And and the word and that's not because I'm something I'm anything different than you. I'm 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 a I'm a flat I'm built of flesh just like everybody else, just like Paul was. Oh wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Well, this book will. Amen. This book will. The Bible says these things, the things which were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So those are three things right there. Patience, comfort, and hope that all come from the scriptures that God promises you and wants you to have and teaches you how to get. But it takes work. Amen? It takes work. Feed the sheep. Turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And look down at verse 28. Well, first of all, uh, verse, look at verse 17. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And then, and when they were come to him, he said unto them, and then he said a bunch of stuff. But in verse, verse 17, and called the elders of the church. So there's more than one elder in the church and to those elders he said in verse 28 take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the holy ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of god which he hath purchased with his own blood so it's your job whether you be the singular pastor of a church or you're a church that has 10 pastors it's your job, each and every one of you, to feed the flock. And to all the flock over, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. And that involves some oversight. But the oversight, as we just saw in Peter, is not a literal rule like, uh, you know, all Sunday school teachers must wear berets. <laughs> or something stupid like that. Or, uh, you know... It's it's not a it's not a it's not a lording it over you. Uh, Jesus talked one time about the how the Gentiles lord it over you, and you and um, you know not what spirit you're of. He said to the sons of thunder. The rule that a that a bishop should have does have uh, is given by God. The authority that a that a that a bishop has is oversight because he's praying for you. He's caring about you. He's feeding you. He's, he's trying to give you, find what you need to hear from the Word of God and pointing you to the right passage that's going to help you in your problem where you're sitting, uh, with, with some problem that you're having with your family or with your children or with, uh, disease or sickness or w whatever it is. It's His job to pray for you, to watch over you, and, and importantly, for your soul. 
Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews, Obey them which have the rule over you, for they watch for your souls. You're supposed to care about the people that you preach to. You're supposed to be interested in their spiritual welfare. The Bible says in one place, uh, rejoice when they rejoice, re- when they do rejoice, and weep when they weep. So when they're crying, you ought to be crying. When someone dies in your church and they're crying because a loved one went on to be with the Lord, and they're crying, yes, you should comfort them because they're home with the, they're home with the Lord, and they're in a better and to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, and uh, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. And you should you should preach all those things to them and try to give them comfort that they're in a good place, and you should have joy over that. But when they cry, you should cry with them. Because you should miss them just like they do. See? People are not machines. They need help. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith the Lord, the Bible says in uh, Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort, patience, hope. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. These are things that all Christians are meant to have. And you, preacher, are meant to show those things to them by being an example of them. You don't just get up and require it, uh, like a, like a Gentile would, uh, lord it over them like the Gentiles. Well, I'm the pastor, I decide what happens. Well, this should happen, that should happen, that shouldn't happen. Well, you know, good luck. I mean, if you get somebody to follow that. But what's probably happened is you got thousands of people pretending like that's what they're doing when they're actually thinking and doing something entirely different. And the whole while not ever getting the thing that God meant them to have, which was your job to feed them with. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's why I try to teach Daniel to preach the, the to preach the word of God. Preach Bible says this. Don't fill your message with stories and illustrations. Not that you can't have an illustration of something that's said in the Bible. But don't let your whole message be some story that ends up uh, giving the impression or teaching a moral lesson that has nothing to do with the Scripture and is not what the Scripture teaches. If you ain't got nothing to say from God, then sit down and shut up. Your job is to feed the flock. Amen. Dr. Urban used to say, feed the flock and they'll feed you. He gave the, uh, 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 and, and the verse that shows that is the, the laborer is worthy of his hire. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. For it is written, the laborer is worthy of his hire. Right? So, Dr. Urban always gives the example of, uh, used to give the example when he was here of, uh, you know, I try to preach, I try to feed the flock, I try to give them as much of the Word of God as they can take. I feed them every week, week in and week out, and when I go uh, to my meetings around the country and preach in different churches, I feed them. And I, everybody I come across, I try to impart some spiritual gift to the end they might be established, in, the, in Paul's words in Romans chapter 1. This is committing your heart and soul to somebody. Not, uh, you know, three points in a poem. I'll see you next week with your tithe. I'm trying to teach you something that, 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 that will help you, that will strengthen you, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, uh, the Bible says, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. He want, God wants you to know some things and not just for the sake of knowledge. He wants you to have charity and love one another. He wants you to do it without partiality, without dissimulation, in the words of of, uh, Romans 12. Not like Peter did in Galatians 2. He wants you to forgive one another. He wants you to love one another with a pure heart fervently. He wants you to lay down your life for the brethren. And how are the people ever going to know that if you don't show that to them, preacher? You can't ever get through, get, you will never be, uh, you will never please God as a preacher and in the sense of your preaching will not please God 
if you don't example the things that you're preaching. Specifically, and, and by the way, I'll give you another tip. The people won't listen to you if they don't think that you care about them. They think, well, he's a smart guy. Well, he's educated. Well, he's certainly qualified because he has, you know, X years study of Greek grammar or he, or he went to such and such Bible college or even in Bible believer circles, quote unquote, he sat under Dr. Ruckman and learned all these great things. Certainly he's capable. Okay, but all of that means nothing if you don't care about them. Rejoice when they do rejoice and weep when they weep because it's your job to feed them like a father feeds his children. Like a shepherd feeds his flock. Like David, as a, as a kid, um, made sure that his, his flock was protected and that they had a place to graze. You're supposed to watch over them. You're supposed to be praying over him. God, he hasn't said anything about it yet, but I noticed in his countenance, something's off. He's doing something bad wrong. And I just pray, Lord, that you bring him back, that you don't don't give him the opportunity. Let him take the way of escape and help me to, to, to show him that there's a way of escape. Help me to get the verse to him. Help me help him to memorize the verse and help him to learn to apply the verse and help him to see the way of escape and help him to take it. Break his legs, Lord, before you let him take that step. Is what you should be praying in tears over each and every one of your converts and your church members. Forgive the expression. Uh, your uh, flock, your flock, uh, every night. Amen. You need to watch over them. You need to think about them. You need to be concerned with their welfare. And the way that you can communicate these things to them is to follow the instructions. And number one, study. Number two, feed them. Number three, take the oversight, but not as lording it over them, but by example, by example, by example, which means you have to have compassion. You have to compare, you have to care about people. You have to show them that your faith in the Word of God is not feigned. That you don't care about their money. That you're not interested in what they can do for you. That what you're interested in is helping them to grow in faith, to grow in comfort, to be strengthened. And by the way, let me show you this. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And there's all kind of things uh, that have to do with the work of a bishop. I've only kind of touched on... The most, the biggest ones, uh, the first ones uh, tonight. Um, first Timothy three. I'll just keep saying it till I get there. First Timothy three. <laughs> I used to remember when you were a kid and you would put your Bible up and they give you a reference. You turn to it real quick. <laughs> Sword drills, they call it. Yeah, I'm not good at that anymore. But here we are, First Timothy three, and look in verse. Uh, uh, look in verse 4. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, so we're talking about ruling, twice the word is used, rule, how shall he take care of the church of God? So to rule is to take care of when it comes to the church of God. Sometimes rule means rule with authority in the sense in which you think, you, you would think, uh, such as Ephesians chapter, uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter 3, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands um, and obey them that have the rule over you. But the rule of a pastor is by example, and it's and you're specifically told not to lord it over. Not to make a point of authority that you have. Because the authority that you have is a spiritual authority that involves prayer and caring for your people and feeding them 
And they may come ask you for advice, and you give them good advice, and you should do what they say. Amen? Not if it's against the Bible. But you should do what they say uh, if it's from the Word of God. Obey them which have the rule over you, for they watch for your souls. All all things are subject to the Word of God. Amen? Um, And we'll get to next time... Uh, other things that have to do with the office of a bishop. Um, I just, uh, as an introduction to the subject, um, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And these are some of the things, some of the key things uh, that are involved in the work of a bishop. Um, and we'll we'll cover more later. That's all I got for tonight. Would you close in a word of prayer, son? Lord, thanks for your word. I pray that you'll help pastors all around the country, all around the world, to follow your book. Um, like Jeff preached, like your word says, I pray that there will be more faithful men around the world, more Christian men who actually read the Bible and actually pray and actually do what's right, stand for you and act as examples. And um, I pray that you'll help us to follow you, help us to be men like that, help me to be more of a man for you, not distracted with worldly things, but focusing on your words and on what you want me to do. And uh, thank you for the message tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.